Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is Wisdom Wednesday. Uh, every Wednesday, uh, I'm teaching and studying the book of Proverbs, and hopefully we get wiser as we study it. I've already uh, uploaded videos on the first 14 chapters, so today we're beginning with chapter 15. If you haven't seen the previous chapters, I hope you go back and watch them. They're available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So without further ado, let me begin with uh, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. It says, I'll read it in the KJV first, because I'm a KJV firstist. I, uh, I do not limit myself only to the KJV, but I'll look at it first. And then if I think it's necessary, I may look at another translation. So here goes Proverbs 15, verse 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Well, it's interesting. I'm, you know, I, when I do these studies, uh, I don't prepare uh, when I, on Wednesday, Wednesday, as I'm going through Proverbs. I'm, I'm not reading ahead. I'm not trying to uh, study it out and prepare to, so I can teach it correctly. I, I'm just kind of surprised sometimes. Like what, 15, verse 15, 1, this happens to be, uh, to me, one of the most important verses, um, I think, that applies to my life and, 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 and people I know here on YouTube. Uh, I, I just pray that we can adopt this verse, this teaching into our lives. I pray that I can adopt it into my life first, and I, I hope that you will learn to do the same thing. A soft answer turneth away wrath. I have a playlist titled uh, Dogmatists. And I, I made the playlist because I discovered that uh, there, there's three major problems that I've been dealing with uh, over the last seven or eight years on YouTube. The first problem I dealt with, it took me about six months to work my way through all of them. The, these were the atheists that I first encountered on YouTube. Uh, I, I did have a little success. There were some atheists that did become believers. And uh, some of them were polite and listened. And, but most of them, the vast majority of them, uh, there was really no communication. So uh, it reaches a point where you have to determine that um, they don't have ears to hear, as Jesus said. And once we discern that, if we continue dealing with them, that Jesus said it's like casting our pearls to the swine. So um, it came to the point with many of these atheists that I ended up having to just uh, give up because uh, if I could spend a thousand hours talking about the gospel and Jesus and salvation, if I could spend a thousand hours doing that, it would be far wiser to spend a thousand hours divided among 10,000 people. Um, and rather than taking a thousand hours on one person and finding out that it's all futility, it's a waste of time. We should be able to discern early on if they have ears to hear. And if they don't, then we're wasting time and we're casting pearls to the swine. So that was my first uh, six months on YouTube. And then uh, that ran its course, and I ended up finding that there's a, a large faction of professing Christians who I, I believe are not Christians at all. They're, they never transferred their faith from believing in self to believing in Jesus. They're holding on to self-righteousness, the, the works or lordship salvation. And so I spent really a lot of years here on YouTube trying to teach these people and correct them uh, and get them away from this works lordship salvation uh, philosophy, the false gospel. And I've um, 
I, I did have some success with a few of them too, but then the vast majority of them, again, it's pearls to the swine. Uh, but that got me to the point now where I've discovered that there is a remnant of real believers. There is a small percentage of, in Christendom, those who identify themselves as Christians, who truly are Christians. They truly believe uh, salvation is a free gift by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. No religious work is required in our part. And you cannot add religious works as a formula for salvation uh, or you've nullified or canceled out the grace of God, the gift of God. So I have come to know that there is a faction of people who really understand salvation. And yet within that group of people who I dearly love and uh, desire fellowship with, I found that there's a, still another problem that I've had to deal with and that is dogmatism. And that's why I've made the playlist Dogmatists. Even though these people do agree with, with me and the scriptures on salvation, uh, all the other theological subjects apart from salvation, uh, they, these are minor in comparison, and yet they elevate them in importance and, and want to fight and divide over minor doctrines. There's, uh, there, there's dozens and dozens of, of, of uh, uh, minor doctors, minor theological questions that are fascinating and interesting and important. Uh, we do want to study and get learn to get them right, but uh, we don't have to be right on those things uh, in, in order to have the free gift, receive the free gift of salvation. And yet, these dogmatists elevate the minor doctrines to such importance that. The, we are all fighting and dividing over it. Uh, now, I, I think it is wise to be able to debate and argue out these things as long as I made a video titled Arguing is Good, as long as we're doing it in a civil manner with respect and courtesy, really listening to each other. And in that way, we can all learn and grow from gaining knowledge. And sometimes someone persuades me to wins me over to their side and Sometimes I may win someone over to my side, uh, but we should never divide over the minor doctrines. That's why part of the creed or statement of faith that I have is in uh, essentials, unity. Let's unify around the core doctrines of Christianity. In non-essentials, liberty. Let's give people the freedom, the liberty to disagree with us on all the minor doctrines we don't have to agree on those things let's welcome opposing ideas and and uh exchange ideas and learn from each other uh and then but in all things grace we're saved because god is gracious to us can can we be gracious to each other so that is uh i think that all applies to this verse right here a soft answer turneth away wrath Unfortunately, this verse is uh, widely ignored by most people I know. Uh, there's only a handful of people I know that can carry on a conversation. And as soon as you hit one of their hot button uh, uh, subjects, they have a knee jerk reaction and start getting angry and raising their voice and offering personal attacks rather than courteously and respectfully discussing the subject. So what I've tried to do is adopt the, the premise of this verse is a soft answer, turn the way wrath. And it is true that many times when people are getting all worked up if you do not respond in kind they're raising their voice but you speak softly they're getting angry but you're remaining peaceful and calm and you are presenting your viewpoints with love and gentleness and meekness 
then uh, many times uh, this soft answer they, they stops them kind of cold in their in their tracks there they're taken taken back I've had many examples I could give you of my dealings with people in street preaching and on YouTube where they've they've come back to me after the initial interaction and said you know I've been thinking about what you said and uh, I feel kind of guilty and ashamed of myself because of uh, the way I got angry and you know things I said to you and, and um, you didn't respond in kind and it, it kind of it made me think and uh, so it doesn't always work but this is the method that we're told in scriptures to adopt uh, and also we find it in the book of James it says be quick to listen most people are slow to listen be slow to speak most people are quick to speak they want to do all the talking and don't listen and be slow to anger most people get angry very quickly so if we can be uh, quick to listen slow to speak slow to anger and offer a soft answer which turns away wrath uh, that is what wisdom and that way we can possibly get results the remainder of verse two, verse one says but grievous words stirs up anger so if some somebody says something angry uh, angry thing to you they're being contentious angry hateful do not respond in kind if you do if you do respond in kind then it elevates everything it escalates everything and now you just have you've stooped there to their own level you're no different than them I've had many times uh, street preaching I've uh, had people come up to me and say uh, you see the, the guy working with you here you see the kind of arguing and 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 he's he's raising his voice and getting angry and almost foaming at the mouth as he's telling people about Jesus and they say if that's what Christianity is I don't want any part of it if he's a Christian I don't want to be one I've heard that many many times uh, so you know we are ambassadors for Christ when people look at us when we name Christ as our Savior people put us under a microscope they observe our lives and, and, and when they see hypocrisy they it's one of the reasons they reject Christianity is the hypocrisy in, of many Christians um, So that's uh, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Let me look at that verse in the Amplified and see if it says anything. A soft and, a soft and gentle and thoughtful answer turns away wrath, but harsh and painful and careless words stir up anger. Okay. So the verse, I think, is straightforward in the KJV. Verse 2. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. The tongue of the wise, that means the, if when a wise person speaks, he uses knowledge, applies his knowledge aright, correctly. But the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. If you're wise, you're going to speak wisdom. If you're foolish, you're going to speak foolishness. How do you get wisdom? Well, that's what we're trying to accomplish here by studying this book called Proverbs. That's the whole purpose of the book is Solomon wanted to teach his son wisdom. 
and now we can also benefit by studying what he taught his son. Look at that in the Amplified. The tongue of the wise speaks knowledge that is pleasing and acceptable, but the babbling mouth of fools spouts folly. <laughs> okay, we'll move to verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. God is omniscient. That means he knows everything. Um, and he is observing everything. There is no place to hide our sinfulness from God. Uh, every action that I've ever done, God's observed it. Even every thought that I've had. You know, and Jesus showed us how he could read people's minds. He told the Pharisees what they were thinking. God not only can observe our actions and our words, but he goes deep inside into our minds, our soul. He knows every thought. There's no place to hide. There are no secrets between us and God. Beholding the evil and the good. Uh, so, the evil and the good can be the, the good people versus the evil people, or even all people, the good and evil that comes out of each one of us, because no one is all good or, or all evil. Uh, if to be completely good, you'd have to be God, as Jesus said. Man can only be relatively good. Verse 4, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but persevere, per, persev, perverseness, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Again, when we see the word tongue is talking about the, the words that are coming out of our mouth. Tongue is used for two things that I know of. Maybe if you're a medical doctor, you can tell me something else the tongue is used for. But it's used to speak and it's used to taste. Um, so this is talking about speaking. A wholesome tongue. When, when we are speaking wholesome things, good things, it's a tree of life. Paul said, Whatever good, whatever pure, what is lovely, think on these things. It's positive thinking. And it, it, it even overflows into what we say. Because Jesus said, uh, what comes out of our mouth is, is really in our hearts. Uh, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Perverseness. Let me see what the Amplified says about that verse 4. A soothing tongue, speaking words that build up and encourage, is a tree of life. The uh, companion of Paul Barnabas, um, he and Paul eventually had a falling out, and then Silas became Paul's companion, co-worker. But Barnabas, his name translates to son of encouragement. Uh, I've had a lot of people over the years on YouTube encourage me. I hope I've been an encouragement to you. 
But those of you who have encouraged me, I want you to know how much I appreciate it. It's, you know, I don't think the you encouragers have any clue as to the value of what you're doing, a ministry of encouragement. A lot of people come to mind, too many to mention you all. Uh, but I've had people say to me, Brother Luke, you know, when you, I was watching you preaching in the streets and, and they go on and praise me and tell me all the, the things they think about. Uh, it's, it's a brave thing to do. It's bold. It's I could never do that or public speaking. I could never do that. I could never make videos. Well, Paul says that the body has many parts. We're not all supposed to be doing the same things. You know, other people are doing things that I cannot do. It's not my gift, not my talent. First thing we should try to do after we become born again as a child of God because of faith in, our faith in Jesus, very first thing we should do is pray, Lord, reveal to me my mission, my mission my ministry, my purpose in this body of Christ. What do you want me to do? Because God has work for all of us to do. We don't work to get saved. It's a free gift because of our faith in Jesus. We don't work to stay saved because salvation is not based upon works in any way. And we don't work to prove we're saved because some people who do no work are truly saved. Scripture says, to the to the uh, man who worketh not, but believeth on him who justified the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. And it says, to the man who worketh not, that means zero work. It doesn't mean he's doing less work than you're doing or I'm doing. No, it means he's doing zero work. So we should understand that work is not a burden imposed on us to get saved or stay saved or prove we're saved. It's work is an honor and a privilege. And Jesus has some work for you to do. So, and it, it is the greatest work, the greatest pleasure you know, when I worked throughout my life to raise money and pay my bills and support my family, I never was blessed to have a job that I loved, that I said, well, I love doing this. Even if they didn't pay me, I would do it. That's how much I love it. Some people are really blessed in life and that uh, they, they love their job so much they do it for free. Maybe they, maybe they turned their as someone once said, if you want to be happy in life, learn to turn your avocation, your hobby. Learn to turn your avocation into your vocation, and you'll always be happy. Then you'll never work a day in your life because you're getting paid for something you just want to do, even if you weren't getting paid. How wonderful is that? Well, I never had that in my life. Uh, I had to labor. The, the jobs I had, I did. I made the best of it. I tried to do the best I could. I tried to turn it into a positive experience, but I never got to earn my living doing something I love to do. But uh, I was blessed to retire at age 54. And the Lord blessed me so that I was financially able to do it. And I made a deal with the Lord. Um, a couple of years before I was able to do that, I said, Lord, Bless me financially so I can leave my job. The time that I used to put into, that I normally put into earning a living, that free me up so I can put that time into serving you. I didn't even know, have any idea that I was, would become an evangelist or a street preacher or anything about YouTube. I just knew that I wanted to serve the Lord somehow. I wanted to work for him. 
And he blessed me. He answered my prayer. I've been able to, I'm 64 now, so I haven't been employed for 10 years. And, uh, you know, I'm not a rich man financially. <laughs> I, I thought I was getting rich at one point, but uh, it's turned out that I don't have financial worries, but I don't have great wealth. But for the last 10 years, I've been able to do work that I love to do. And that is telling people about Jesus, talking about the scriptures, teaching and studying and learning together. And that is a pleasure. It's a joy. So I think the most important thing you can do after you get saved is pray, Lord, reveal to me what you want me to do. And then after that, once you understand, once you get enlightened and realize this is the Lord's mission for your life, your ministry, every Christian should be a minister. That means a servant. We need to serve Jesus some way. Find out what his plan for you, for your ministry, and then get busy and do it. And if it's truly what the Lord has planned for you, you're going to find joy in it. It won't be laborious. It'll be joyful. But, oh, the reason I got off onto that tangent is because of this idea of encouragement, a soothing tongue, speaking words that build up and encourage is a tree of life. Well, I was talking about how so many people have encouraged me, and then they, but they've said to me, uh, I, I'm not bold enough to do what you do. Well, you know, you're not supposed to do what I'm doing. You know, I, you're supposed to do what God has for you to do. Find out what it is and do it. But but you might not even realize it. The encouragement that you've offered me has been such a blessing. And the ministry of encouragement is, is so beautiful and wonderful. Don't underestimate your value as an encourager. goes on to say, but a perversive tongue, speaking words that overwhelm and depress, crushes the spirit. Well, even before I became a Christian, I recognized that I didn't want to be around people who were negative. Always talking about negative things. Always bringing, uh, you know, gloom and doom and negativity and... Uh, into the conversations. I didn't want to be around that. Uh, I knew that for me to su succeed in life, I had to have a positive attitude. And people who are negative, being perverse, as it says here in the Amplified, a perversive tongue speaking words that overwhelm and depress. If you're depressing, I mean, now if you need counseling, if you're depressed and you need counseling, that's one thing. But if you're just a negative person that always wants to talk about and introduce negative aspect of everything instead of a positive aspect uh, into the conversation and into life, then that's a person I want to avoid. Uh, and, and, it, and it is a uh, something that will, it, it's like unforgiveness too, unforgiveness. If you have unforgiveness in your life, if you have a negative attitude, these are things that will just make you sick physically. I think that uh, in that way, it's similar to unforgiveness. Uh, uh, un unforgiveness, there's a saying, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and believing that the other person is going to get sick and die. That's unforgiveness. And it's the same thing with just negative attitude. You know, trying to bring your depression and bring other people down too. That's the opposite of being an encourager. Encourager is offering a positive outlook, trying to help people, encourage them to succeed and be happy. Okay, back to the KJV. Uh, 
A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. A fool despiseth, that means he hates. There was a poem, my family, uh, my brother was an unbelievably gifted, talented writer and poet. I have a poem. You should listen to it it's on my YouTube channel. Well, I just recite a poem my brother wrote. It's very powerful, very tragic. Yeah, very tragic poem. It's called The Scarlet Lover. But uh, we used to read a lot of poetry in my within my family. And uh, one of the poems was uh, dried apple pies. Uh, there's a, a line in the poem that says, I loathe, I abhor, I detest, I despise, I abominate dried apple pies. All these words mean they hate, they hate. And it, it says here, the lips of the wise, oh, I'm sorry, uh, a fool despiseth his father's instruction. A fool hates it when his father's trying to teach him something. That's really being foolish. Um, my father, see you now, I'm a baby boomer. And my father's generation, that generation is commonly called the greatest generation. Because during that lifetime, they endured the, the Great Depression and the and World War II. Um, but that generation was a lot different than, than mine in a lot of ways. And uh, my father's uh, mindset was uh, he would work. You know, he worked a lot so that he had, our family always had enough. And... Uh, and then any time that he was home, uh, it wasn't like father-son time playing. He, he never played catch with me once. I mean, I played sports a lot as, as a, a child. And, uh, never played catch with me. Never played any sports. Never watched me play my sports. He went to only one sporting event in my life that he saw. Uh, his idea of interacting was so the sink is broken so Luke you come and help me I'm, I'm gonna teach you how to fix the sink and uh, I didn't like his instruction I get uh, you know I had other plans I wanted to I want to spend time with my friends and play but he'd often pull me aside and have some job and paint the house do this on the roof change the uh, the swamp cooler, the evaporative cooling system in the house and work on that. I did a lot of things like that, that and that was father son time. And I didn't like it. I didn't, I resented it. Uh, I hated it at that time. Looking back though, my father and I didn't relate in any other way except in that way and, until he got old and retired and, and th then he had some leisure time and I got to spend a lot of leisure time with him and really get to know him and, and uh, appreciate him and, and I love him. But my point is that there's a difference between his generation and my generation, the baby boomers. Um, uh, my, my relationship with my son was everything that I did, my son as a little infant all the way through teenage years he was like attached to my hip he was like my Siamese twin he did everything with me uh, all my activities all my sports all my exercise he was on my back riding along and uh, it was it was wonderful and then he got 16 years old and got a driver's license and he's gone spending time with his, a lot of friends and it was hard to, to deal with that but it was a totally different kind of a situation with my father dedicating himself to work and very little time with the kids. And in my case, 
me being very close to my son. And so I did learn for some things from my father, but there's much more I wish I could have learned from him if I had the right attitude. Um, but my son, I'm very happy to say, he's 35 years old now, and he already has a lot of wisdom. He, he is light years ahead of me in life. Um, and uh, I have spent quite a bit of time trying to teach him a lot of basic things to succeed in life, how to set goals, how to live on a budget, how to do financial planning, you know, and, and, uh, and he's listened and he's applied these things and he succeeded. So a fool despiseth his father's instruction. I was a fool. I didn't want to listen to my father's instruction. I did what I had to do grudgingly. And a lot of time, because of my attitude, I'd hit the back of his hand on my face or his foot on my butt because I had I was a fool, despised instruction. And I'm thankful that my son has had a different attitude. He, he listens and he learns and he's better off because of it. The fool despiseth his father's instructions, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Regardeth means he, he respects and he values reproof. In other words, right now, if you think I'm wrong about anything I'm saying, or if you've gone through my videos and you think I'm wrong about something, and you want to reprove me, correct me, show me my errors, and teach me, I welcome it. I, I, I want to be corrected. There's another saying that um, uh, remember why we debate. In other words, debate means, in this perspective, means that uh, we are willing to share ideas, try to persuade each other, but as long as it's done with courtesy and respect, not anger. Remember why we debate, why we have these discussions on theology. And um, uh, the only thing we have to lose, if, if you think I'm wrong or I think you're wrong and we have a discussion about it, the only thing we have to lose by debating things are the errors we hold. And if I'm holding an error, I want you to correct me. I want to listen. Yeah, because I listen does not obligate me to be persuaded. You have, it's your job to persuade me. It's my job to listen. And over the years, there have been some people who have persuaded me, and I've changed uh, various theological positions. I've, all, I've never been persuaded against the core doctrines of Christianity. Jesus is eternal God Almighty, manifest in the flesh. Faith is a free gift by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. No religious work is required for salvation. And once saved, we're always saved. We cannot lose our salvation for any reason. No matter who's tr tried to tell me otherwise, they've never convinced me because it's so clear and obvious that this, these doctrines are true. But in a hundred other theological subjects, I've listened. And on some occasions, I've discovered hey, I was wrong. And I've been happy to be corrected. So the, the statement is, remember why we debate. The only thing we have to lose are the errors we hold. Who but a stubborn fool would hold on to errors once they've been exposed? Well, that fits right along with Proverbs. Uh, he that regardeth reproof is prudent. He that desires, respects, values, reproof, that is correction, is prudent. You're wise. It is wise to listen to people who want to tell you you're wrong. But they have to prove I'm wrong before I'm going to be persuaded. And what I do is I say, show me in here. That's where I need to be proved. Not from philosophers or extra biblical writings. 
Let's look at verse 5 in the Amplified. A flippant, arrogant fool rejects his father's instruction and correction, but he who is willing to learn and regards and keeps in mind a reprimand requires good sense. And that's what's happening right now. If you disagree with anything in these Proverbs, then uh, uh, then the Proverbs are there to c correct you and teach you. Will you be wise and value what, what you're learning right now in this book of Proverbs? Or will you be foolish and, and despise this instruction? In the KJV, Verse 6, in the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. Well, it goes back to the, another the basic idea of reaping and sowing. Uh, if you're righteous and you're doing good things, you're going to get treasures. Uh, you're going to get wealth. You're going to get success. You're going to be blessed. You're going to reap good things because you've sowed well. But on the other hand, the revenues of the wicked is trouble. But the, but the wicked gain, if you do wicked things, what you're going to get in return for that is trouble. You will reap what you sow. You sow good, you'll reap good things. So evil, you reap bad things. It's a law. It applies to everyone, Christians and non-Christians. Verse 7, the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. So when we're wise, we want to share our knowledge. We want to help other people. I'm kind of in a vehicle outside and make a lot of noise. Wow. Okay, it's the uh, landscapers in the neighborhood doing some work. I hope it's not too distracting. Um, verse 8. The fact, sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. Uh, so uh, this will apply to the sacrificial um, uh, era of uh, biblical history. Under Mosaic laws, they had the sacrificial system. And you can offer sacrifices. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. So, if you're if you're wicked and you're offering sacrifices, and you know God's not going to be happy with it, uh, your sacrifices will mean mean nothing. But the prayer of the upright is his delight. Uh, verse nine: The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord, but He loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Verse 10, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. And he that hateth reproof shall die. It's, these are ways of repeating the same idea about uh, some people don't want to be corrected. And that's foolish. Um, hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? I better look at an Amplified in verse 11 here. Let's see if it helps me. Sheol, that's the netherworld, the place of the dead, and Abaddon, that's the abyss, the place of eternal punishment, lie open before the Lord. How much more the hearts and inner motives of the children of men. Okay, so it is telling us that, you know, 
God can see hell, the abyss, you know, the, he can see that it's right before him. He's, he's aware of it. How much more are the hearts and inner motives of the children of men, you and me, all of us, how much more God is also aware of our inner thoughts, our motives. As I said in the beginning of the study today, that you have no secrets. God knows everything you do, everything you say, even everything you think. He knows your heart. Um, verse 12, a scoffer. Oops, let's look at that in the first KJV. 12, a scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go, un go unto the wise. Verse 12 in the Amplified, a scoffer, unlike a wise man, resents one who rebukes him and tries to teach him, nor will he go to the wise for counsel and instruction. So, in many different ways, Solomon is, is telling us, you're a fool if you don't want to listen to instructions. Don't be a fool. It's wise to get counsel. It's wise to listen to people. But you should also be like the Bereans. Paul preached to the people who lived in the city of Berea, and they liked what he said, and they believed it, but they did double-checked. They went to the scriptures themselves to see if it was so. So listen, but test everything by the scriptures. Um, verse 13, a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. A merry heart make a cheerful countenance. A countenance is how you look. Like, uh, I remember a couple of years ago, an old friend from way back in my high school days contacted me because we had like a 40 year high school reunion. And we became reacquainted and talked over the phone. She told me that her face had a like a permanent frown on it. And my mother often told me, said, don't, don't frown. Your face will freeze like that. And it sounded stupid, you know, to me then, like, a, like an old wife's tale or something. They also told me that dragonflies would, don't get a dragonfly near you because they'll sew your lips together. It's, so it sounded similar to that, and that, uh, that's ridiculous. If you have, a, if you frown, your face is not going to freeze into a frown, but it does. Um, my old friend said that her face, her normal expression on her face, was a frown. Her corner of her mouth were, was turned down, and that's her normal facial expression, her countenance. Uh, but, and that's sad because. I learned something a few years ago, uh, scientifically, that they've determined that when we smile or when we laugh, that it causes a, a response in our brain. And there's a chemical reaction going on in our brain. Endomorphins are produced and released. And endomorphins make you happy, make you high, make you uh, really feel good. And they said that that's what happens when we smile or, or laugh. And they said that it's, it's not even necessary that the smile is a sincere smile. All that's necessary is the corner of your mouth are turned up. So if you do this right now, if you just lift the corners of your mouth up, you'll get happy. It happens. It's, it's the, the brain's response to that, these muscles coming up. And that's your countenance. Do you walk around with a 
countenance like this, like you're angry, you're depressed all the time, well then that's that's going to cause your brain to feel that way. You walk around with a smile on your face and you smiling and laughing, you're going to be happy and the people around you are going to be happy. I've, I've said many times to people I've, I've met, my first meeting with someone is, I, I always want to compliment them. I don't want to flatter them in the respect that I uh, make up something nice about them that's not true. Like, uh, if, if they're uh, uh, if they're overweight, I'm not going to say, "Oh, you look really physically fit." That would be an obvious lie and untrue, and it, it, it's not. But I, I can usually find something about somebody that, it, that I can compliment because I want to encourage them, uplift them. And one thing that stands out to me immediately is when I meet someone who's smiling, has a big smile, I want to say your smile is wonderful. I mean, your smile is a blessing to me. Because you smile, I'm happy. I, I appreciate it. And so when we smile, when we have that kind of countenance, it's not only helping us, it's helping all the people that we encounter. Uh, a merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. And I would say the opposite is true. A cheerful countenance make the merry heart. Because as I said, your brain reacts and you actually get happy because you smile. But a sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. Yeah. It's horrible to have, see someone with a broken spirit who's sad and depressed. But sometimes these things can be resolved with a simple thing like, hey, try smiling and you'll see it will help you. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that is of a merry heart hath the continual feast. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Yeah, so the, the first and most important thing a person needs to do in their life is be born again as a child of God. I'm going to end here in a few minutes. This is a perfect way of leading into the conclusion of each study. And that is that uh, what's the most important thing in life? Well, there's, there's a lot of charitable organizations that feed people and clothe people and offer all kinds of assistance. And that's a wonderful thing to do. And as, as Christians, that can be a wonderful ministry. But really, what good is it uh, to help someone in that way and yet they end up going to hell because they never put their faith in Jesus. The first, the uttermost important thing is that we must tell people about Jesus. Uh, there's no greater kindness, no greater love that can be shown than to share our faith about Jesus. Um, Better is little with the fear of the Lord. So when it, uh, it says with the fear of the Lord, that's the respect of the Lord, re respecting the Lord, revering the Lord, loving the Lord. The Lord is Jesus Christ. And when we love him and, uh, and uh, believe in him and get salvation, when we become a child of God, then uh, it doesn't even matter the other things. All the other things in life are of secondary importance. So first of all, we must put our faith in Jesus. And even if we don't get wealth, if we don't get health, if we don't get all kinds of other blessings in life, we've at least we've secured that thing that is the most important, that is eternal life in heaven. So if you want eternal life in heaven, uh, I'm going to tell you how to get it. Now, I've asked many people this question. 
do you want to go to heaven? And I, it's surprising that I've actually met some people that say, no, I don't want to go to heaven. And it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, some people would feel that way, but they sincerely don't want to go to heaven. They either don't really believe there's a heaven, or they believe that hell would be more appealing. They think their friends are in hell, and they're going to have parties and orgies in, in hell. That's going to be a fun time. But I have news for you, if that's what you think. The party in hell has been canceled due to the fire. But those people are few and far between. Uh, if, you, if you are one of these people and you don't want to go to heaven right now, well, maybe someday you'll change your mind. You'll say, I do want to go to heaven, but I don't know how. I want to tell you how you can go to heaven. The one way that you can go to heaven. And that is what Jesus said. He said, I am the way. He's the way to heaven. I'm the truth. He's the only truth you need. And I'm the life. The life. He is life everlasting. Eternity in heaven. Eternal life in heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he said, to nail it down, to, to show you the importance of him alone, he says, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus not only claimed to be the way to heaven, the way to get eternal life, the truth you need to know and believe in, but he also said, and I'm the only way. Don't try to get there any other way. I'm the only way for you to get to heaven. So if that's what you've got to do. You've got to believe in Jesus in order to get to heaven. So I want to tell you who he is and, and what he's done for you. Uh, the scriptures say that there's one God, one Savior, and it says that Jesus Christ is Savior. Jesus Christ is God. Uh, it says that he is God manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. He said that, that he came down from heaven and he said, I came to give my life as a ransom. The reason he became a man, came down from heaven and became a man, was to give his life as a ransom. See, man could not have a relationship with God because man is sinful. We're all sinners in varying, to varying degrees. But every one of us is a sinner. Some sin more than others. And the varieties and proclivities of sin are different for each of us. It's, but it doesn't matter the types of sin. It doesn't matter the numbers of sin. We're all sinners. And because of that, God's holy and perfect. Man's not. So he can't have a relationship with God. Man needs to be cleaned of his sins. And Jesus came to do that. He said he came to give his life as a ransom. He died on a cross to set us free from this sin problem. And the scriptures say that when we put our faith in Jesus, uh, not only are our sins no, lo no longer exist, the Bible says that he will remember our sins no more. So they're gone. God will not even acknowledge that we've sinned. It says that he's cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. As far as the east is from the west. That's the picture of Jesus on the cross. That's how far he cast our sins away. Our sins were put on Jesus Christ on the cross. So now you, you are not prohibited from being with God. The sin problem has been solved. Now the only problem is the Son, the Son of God. What will you do with Jesus Christ? The Bible says, he who believeth on the Son hath life. If you believe on the Son of God, Jesus Christ, you will have life everlasting. It also says, he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So, Jesus paid for your sins. Now you can have a relationship with God 
and and all you've got to do is believe on the Son of God, Jesus Christ. He paid for your sins, and the reason we can put our confidence in Jesus, the reason I have confidence, the reason I have so much faith, and I'm so convinced, is because Jesus said, I'm going to give you a sign, a sign that proves who I am and what I've, everything I've said is true. And he said he's God and he's the Savior. He said he'd pay for our sins so we can have life everlasting. How did he prove it? He raised himself from the dead. The, Paul says the gospel is Christ died for our sins. He was buried. On the third day, he was raised from the dead. And then he walked for 40 days among the people. Uh, uh, the apostles saw him. Uh, his brother James saw him. Hundreds of other people saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. And then he left and went up to heaven, sitting at the right hand of the Father. But he raised himself the dead to prove to us that he is God and he is the only Savior so that we can be confident and know our faith in him is not in vain. So someone asked the Apostle Paul, I want to be saved. Well, what do I have to do? What must I do to be saved? And Paul answered succinctly. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And I'm certainly not going to contradict the Apostle Paul. Uh, scriptures tell us that uh, we're saved by grace. And, and, and uh, grace is not grace if you add works to it. See, grace means no work. And work means no grace. You cannot mix them together because they cancel each other out. They nullify. They frustrate each other. So you've, you've got to understand that uh, we're, we're saved because of the grace of God only because God is so gracious and kind and loving to us and we're saved through faith, not by any works we do, not by any religious works we do. And, and we're saved because of our faith in Jesus. Jesus, this great Savior God. So that's what you must do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't believe in your own ability to get to heaven through your own efforts. Kick that doctrine out of your house, out of your life, out of your mind. Put no confidence in that and reject it completely. Instead, believe on Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus. Depend on Jesus. Rely upon Jesus completely. And when you do that, you get the Holy Spirit of God comes to live in you forever. And he, the Spirit begins to transform you. Your life starts to change. So that's the good news. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believe on Jesus, you will have eternal life promised to you, guaranteed to you, eternal life in heaven. Please do it today. So that's the study for today. And uh, I will pick up where I left off. This was, uh, the last verse was, um, okay, where was it? Uh, Verse 16 was the last one. So I'm going to make a note. There's Proverbs. Uh, Pro Proverbs 15. Verse 17 is where I'll pick up next time. So I hope you join me every Wednesday at 1 p.m for Wisdom Wednesdays as we go through Proverbs. Also join me every Sunday, 1 p.m. Pacific time, and uh, I'm doing character studies. And in the past, we've, we've, we've studied uh, Adam and Eve, uh, Satan, uh, uh, Noah, um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and now we're studying Job. So join me Sundays and Wednesdays at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.